Raymond, do we do you want us to use microphones? Um, your call. Okay. I feel like the microphone will make the recording better. Well, hey, welcome, everybody. We're going to use microphones just for the purpose of recording. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be more people coming in because, you know, it's the first session and not everyone's warning people like us, right? It's nice and early. Oh, an early pastor. Hi. Hey, we're not talking about you. <laughs> yeah, we're slowly just going to talk and let people trickle in. Let tr people trickle in. But. Anyways, we're excited to talk about discipleship. My name is Bryce. I'm one of the pastors here as the senior associate pastor. Just kind of do a lot of a variety of roles and tasks. And uh, yeah, my name is Nathan. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Evangel. Which, uh, yeah, I mean, this is about discipleship, but this isn't just like, hey, this is Pastor Nate's job to implement this. This is like every single person that's on our staff. Uh, what we're going to talk about is the overarching vision of discipleship at Evangel. Yeah. So um, we, we titled it Milk and Steak, obviously, from 1 Corinthians 3.2. And uh, just this understanding of leading a church and ministering to people in the church. It's this really difficult tension. And so that's kind of what we want to dive into um, as we talk about discipleship. Um, anything else you want to say before we... No, I'm just excited. Uh, this is important, right? This is part of the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And so uh, how we do that and being intentional about it is just super important. And I think we've just, you know, we're not going to say we're experts up here. A lot of stuff we've learned from other places, things through trial and error. And uh, yeah, so by no means are we saying like we got everything figured out. Uh, we're here on a journey. Uh, to figure out how to fulfill the Great Commission to the best of our ability as well, too. I'll also say that we, you know, reached out to a lot of churches, and they're scratching their heads, you know, in the same way we have been, and uh, I felt really encouraged about where we're at and kind of some of the things that we've been doing over even just this past year. And so um, I believe that um, some of these things hopefully will be a blessing to you guys and, and help you. Um, really solidify and define what, what does discipleship look like for us. And so we're going to start off, um, and I just, we felt like it was important to talk about really the tension that we all should live in of going after the one while discipling the 99. And I think sometimes as churches we think, oh, we have to choose one or the other. We, we're going to be an outreach base, uh, reaching the lost church, and, uh, and we'll have small groups off to the side. Or we're going to be, you know, it's the deep and wide Andy Stanley concept. Or we're going to be the church that is very deep in our discipleship. And we're going to equip the, the, the church to be the church. And, and they're going to go reach the lost. And we're not going to tailor our Sunday services. We're not going to tailor anything we do at the church to the lost. And we're going to use really churchy words that no one understands. And, uh, and so it's like, can we do both? Can we both disciple people <clears throat> while reaching the lost? And so... <clears throat> Sorry. And so for us, um, our lead pastor is always going to die on the hill of we are called to reach the lost. Okay. Our name is Evangel at, at our church. And so it's, it's built into who we are. It's built into our DNA to say we are going to go after the one. But that's not just because that's what our conviction is based off of what our personal preference is. We know Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, and, and he even lays it out in Luke chapter 15, giving three different illustrations of how much you and I should put our efforts and our strategy and our energy and our resources towards going after the one. And so um, we've kind of adopted this mentality that everything we do, um, like our weekend services, we're going to be unbalanced towards the one, like 70-30. We're going to be 70% leaning towards reaching the one. And then we're going to also be considering what does it look like for the 99 as well. And so what do I mean by that? <clears throat> I mean, the things that we say from the stage, does a new person, does the, the unchurched, does the person who has no idea um, what 
a small group is. Do they understand what we're talking about when we announce something from the stage? Um, and if you have anything you want to chime in when I'm talking about this, the one, you go for it. Okay, yeah. But, um, and so there is this tension built in with our staff that I think is a really good, healthy tension. Um, this tension that we're going to go reach the one, but then there's also those on our team that are like, we need to disciple. We need to disciple. It's in my title, the discipleship pastor, you know? So uh, he's the guy over there like, hey, we can't forget to disciple people. And so um, I, I love that our staff, our team has really this built in tension under the same roof of people saying, no, we got to go reach the lost. And no, we got to disciple people. And, and they both value, we all, like both sides value each other and what they're trying to say. And so Pastor Josh really has allowed us to say, all right, what does it look like to have strategy to disciple? Because I think a lot of us, um, we spend a lot of time trying to, to, to create strategy to reaching the lost. Like what event are we going to do for back to school? Or what, what are we going to do to make our Easter services really good? And a lot of times discipleship can be an afterthought. And so I don't know where you're at, but I think the first part for us to, to figure out where we landed was where do we attach, naturally lean towards? Are we naturally leaning towards reaching the lost? Or are we naturally leaning towards discipling the 99 and kind of forgetting about the one? And, and everything that we say, everything that we do, only a church person gets. And so what we did is we created for you guys just kind of a, a four-phase evaluation uh, extra, uh, worksheet that we would encourage you to take and do with your team, like set aside two to four hours. I mean, we've set hours and days aside to, yeah. to dive through a lot of this stuff and work through some of these questions. But we think in terms of questions of saying, uh, what is our strategy? What is our, what is our vision for discipleship? But I think, um, so the first really exercise that I think is important for you guys to sit down and do is, is this first uh, exercise of the one versus the 99 evaluation. Do we lean more towards the one or more towards the 99? I just put three questions on there. There's probably 20 more questions that could give you a more accurate gauge. And you could probably answer it yourself without even knowing uh, what these questions are. But it's this idea, is your church calendar full of more events that are geared towards reaching the one? Or is it geared towards gathering the 99? Is your, do we spend more of our resources, our budget, our energy towards reaching the one or building community for the 99? Is your community, or is your communication more focused towards the one or the more mature believer? And I think, you know, you can scale in there, add it up. If you're more on the 10 side, you're closer to the 99. If you're more on the one side, you're closer to the one. And I think for us, it starts here saying, are we more unbalanced towards the one or the 99. Um, if you're more unbalanced towards the 99, then I would say you probably need to go in a breakout group where you're thinking about how do I do outreach? How do I reach my city? Um, because you probably have a lot of great strategies towards the 99 and you need to just pick it and pick a discipleship strategy. So I'll let you take it away. Yeah. You know, let me just add on a little bit to what Pastor Bryce is saying. I think when we're starting to talk about creating a discipleship, culture at your church, uh, really it's being self-aware. How am I just naturally bent is really what this first portion is. And so if you're bent towards, you know, evangelism, I think, uh, you know, like we talked about, like, uh, you know, we all have like different bets on our staff. Like I'm the discipleship guy. I want to know that I'm winning from my lead pastor, right? And uh, if we aren't doing this, I feel like I'm going to get fired any moment, okay? <laughs> But uh, we're all, like, the tension there, it's, I like what Pastor Doug Graham said yesterday. It's, you know, we can be in the same key in a song, but each of us hits a different note, right? And the note of the lead pastor is always going to be the loudest note that uh, plays in the song, but our job is to hit the G and uh, help bring that to the church. And so being self-aware of, of how you're just naturally bent is honestly the first step when it comes to this. And we had to do that uh, for ourselves. Like Pastor Bryce said, like evangel story, like the name evangel means, you know, evangelism. It's euangelion in Greek, right? It's the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, over the last seven years, we've seen just a really uh, 
big increase of people coming to evangelism. When I started here about six years ago, our church was probably about 1,500 people. Uh, and that's both adults and kids. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, I mean, we've had uh, 3,000 adults at Mother's Day. We had an average adult attendance of about 2,700, 600 kids that are coming. And so we've kind of just been like a water, like a water hose down our throat with all these new people that are coming to our church. And that's really uh, this tension that we've had to had to experience like, hey, we're winning all these people for Jesus and they're coming to our church. But at the same time, like we have got to disciple them. We got to <laughs> disciple them. Like if evangelism is winning people, discipleship is maintaining people. And if we don't disciple them, what's going to happen is that it's like the parable of the sower, what Jesus says, that the, the seeds could be casted, but the worries of life are going to choke out the seeds or whatever happens to them. And so that's why discipleship is so important. But uh, we've existed in this tension. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of our events were based towards the loss. A lot of our resources, all our staffing was based towards that. And uh, we just had to really come back and just go, okay, how are we going to do this and actually disciple people at our church? I think the next thing that's really important when you're looking at this document that we made for you guys, your phase one is self-evaluation of where you're at. Phase two is who are you trying to reach? Because if you're going to start trying to disciple somebody, it's good to know what are the types of people that are coming to my church. And so like Jesus, when he went and called out people to be his disciples, he knew that they were fishermen. He knew that they were tax collectors. He knew who they were. And so what we would also encourage you guys to do uh, as a team is to, when you guys get away, is to really start to focus on who you're trying to reach. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I think for us, when, like you said, we realized like we had to narrow down who is our one. And um, we have a, a whole community of people that we could try to reach, but really asking the question, who did God create an evangel to, to reach? And um, and so really narrowing down, like, if we were to build our weekend services for the one, who is that one? And part of our story is we, we created a profile, we created an avatar, and put a name to that person and a characteristic to that person, and what motivates this person. And, uh, and so that's really what this phase two exercise really is all about. It's you saying as a church, who is our one? What is our community look like and let's sit down as a team and figure out what is that our, our guy was named mr. Jens and uh, and so that's kind of part of our story that I think you're gonna get into here shortly and so we think it's important for you to discover who your one is so you know how to disciple them like Jesus many times did a lot of his discipleship moments in a boat why? Because a lot of those guys he was discipling were fishermen. They understood that, you know? And so why would we use discipleship methods that don't resonate with the one that we're trying to disciple? And uh, and so I think really considering that, yeah. which is why the, some of the things that we do may not work in your context. You need to understand the principles of discipleship, but then lay it against the background of your community. Yeah, so we had all these people coming to Evangel, and so this is what our gut reaction was. We need connect groups. We need small groups. And what we thought is that we just start launching group leaders. What we're going to start having is a culture of discipleship. That is a fallacy. Okay? I think a lot of churches, we do this. We start just launching groups thinking uh, that's going to solve the issue of discipleship. And, uh, you know, really, we would say that just having groups was not enough of a vision. Just the fact that you have groups, we were focused more on the method than we were on the destination. Yeah. Right? And if I was likely to go to the Minneapolis, I would want to choose the right vehicle to take me there. I have a Murano and I have a Volkswagen. The one that I want to drive is the one that's going to get me be a lot cheaper, the Volkswagen, right? <laughs> And so we had to realize like, hey, just having groups is not enough to actually get to the culture of discipleship. And we tried so many different types of groups. 
We did sermon-based groups. When I, when I remember, I took it over after Pastor Bryce, and ever started it, and then he took it over. Yep. Started watching. I watched Pastor Josh's message. I sit there taking the best notes possible. Then I'm not even good at video editing, so then I went and like spliced videos, made questions for it, and then sent it out to all the groups. Okay, I've done that. Uh, we did something called soap groups, where really we just created, this is how we read the Bible. Everyone has to soap because I was trying to create a culture of everyone reading the Bible. And uh, even we use Right Now Media groups. We did so many different types of groups and uh, realizing that it wasn't really fulfilling what we needed it to fulfill. And this really led us to just sit down and ask ourselves, okay, now that we know who our one is, like, who are they actually becoming? Not what are they doing, but who are they becoming? And so Pastor Bryce and I, and uh, we got permission for Pastor Josh to go and do this, but we went and uh, we got some, what's that, Dunbaros up north? Got some pizzas, got some Cokes, got some coffee, and we brought this long scroll, and we called it the Bryce and Nate scrolls, and we sent it out, and then we just really started thinking with the end in mind. And uh, this is where we came to our Mr. Gents exercise. Okay? Mr. Gents is on so official. Yeah, we didn't, we act, Mr. Gents. It's not copyrighted anywhere. Yeah, nobody, nobody's named Mr. Gents in our church. We just made a name up for him. Okay? So really what we did is we started off asking ourselves, What are all the different outcomes that are happening at Evangel? Like, who are the leaders? What are they doing, right? And so we were like, okay, well, we have youth group leaders, right? We have reach trip leaders, people who lead. Welcome team leaders. Right? Welcome team leaders. Care coaches. Yeah, care coaches. Just a lot of them. E-kids, yeah. right? all these different things that people are doing. And I think what we began to realize is that this is not what, like if this is our aim, is all these different things that people can do, then we're aiming at the wrong thing. Because there's actually a step before this that we actually need to strategize towards. And that's who Mr. Gents was. Before everybody becomes one of these, they must first become this. And this is Mr. Jens. Actually, initially he was called Project X. <laughs> then we changed to Mr. Jens. <laughs> but, uh, and then we started asking ourselves this. Because Nate, I, cause I think what we realized is we were getting a lot of leaders, and God never called us to create leaders, but disciplers. Yeah. And so we had a lot of great people that could schedule and could train. But man, a lot of the depth of their relationship with Jesus and emotional health and spiritual health was not there. And so we're like, man, we're raising up a lot of leaders, but, but we missed something. Like, they're not being discipled. And so um, we basically said, man, if, if no one ever became a leader, because there's only so many room, like only so many spots for someone to lead. Someone's got to follow, right? So does that mean the pinnacle of, of discipleship is being a leader? No. Everyone can make disciples. And so we said, if our leaders aren't even making disciples, then we're missing something. And so we changed the pinnacle from being a leader to saying everyone can be a disciple and really defining that. Yeah. And so, you know, and just like, and then after they grew into this, and we're going to talk about what this person looks like, why we chose what how to develop them in the way that we did. Uh, this is really based off what they feel called to do, right? Once they become discipled, it's not that they can't become a leader, but also there are a lot of people that are disciples that are actually just not good leaders. Yeah. Like they shouldn't lead a connect group. <laughs> you know, because they're just not good at leading. And it's not that people can't learn to lead, right? Everyone can learn to be a leader. But uh, people have natural bents, and people have callings on their heart, and we want to honor that, but also realize that we want our door greeters to be well discipled. Yeah. We want our key kids check-in people to be well discipled. I mean, how awesome would it be if someone showed up to your church 